Now, how do you react when you hear that there is a fugitive at large, a man wanted by the authorities? Recently, of course, we had the case of the Skull Cracker, a man on the run from prison where he was serving time for violent armed robbery. With a name like that, I don't think we really needed the warning not to approach him. And one day I was working at home in my study, and for hours on end it felt like there was a helicopter right above our house. It was impossible to work. And then I turned on the news. Sure enough, you could have guessed it, the skull cracker was found in Mile End. Well, renowned famous fugitives, once they hit the big time, they reach the FBI 10 most wanted list. You know how it works. The photo displayed prominently. Next to that, details of the crimes they are alleged to have committed, a reward for information leading to their arrest. I don't know if there was a Jerusalem most wanted list, but if there was, Jesus Christ was most certainly on it. We see that in the very first line sentence from our chapter. After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews were seeking to kill him. So Judea, which is where Jerusalem was, Jesus was a wanted man. The authorities were out to get him, to arrest him, to kill him if they could. And hearing that, I guess like when we're told someone is on the FBI 10 most wanted list, we ask, well, what have they done? Why so notorious? And actually in John's Gospel, there is one incident that did particularly light the fuse in Jesus' case. You see, a few months beforehand, Jesus had visited Jerusalem. He'd encountered a man who'd been paralyzed for 38 years. He'd said to him, get up, take up your bed, and walk. And then stunningly, that is exactly what the man had done. Immediately, an astonishing display of power and authority. And that is why, it turns out, not everyone was happy. Far from it. Because of that, Jesus was now in danger. His life was at risk. And that's why we heard at the beginning of chapter 7, Jesus resists going up to Jerusalem, at least initially. But it is the Feast of Booths, an important Jewish festival. And so in due course, he makes the trip. And this chapter is showing us three things that the fugitive does when he is in Jerusalem, in the hotbed of that opposition to him. The first is that Jesus divides. Jesus divides. Wherever he goes, Jesus causes a stir. You see, for a start, what he said was astonishing. Look down to verse 15. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? Now, Jesus' turn of phrase has entered our vernacular today salt of the earth, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, wolf in sheep's clothing, and much, much more. Think of the stories, if you like, Jesus told, the prodigal son, the good Samaritan, compelling and moving. Jesus spoke with authority. He connected with people. So much so, look down to verse 46. The officers answered, no one ever spoke like this man. So those are the words of this man, Jesus. But then, of course, there were actions too. We've already thought about the healing of the paralytic, but there was more. At a wedding, he turned water into wine. A boy at the point of death was healed. From a packed lunch, he provided enough food to feed thousands. Those are miracles in John's Gospel called signs because they point to who Jesus is and what he came to do. And that then prompts the question, of verse 31. Yet many of the people believed in him. They said, when the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? Now, the Christ is the Old Testament name for that king that we've been thinking about this afternoon. The king God promised to rescue and rule God's people. The Old Testament scriptures had looked forward to it for centuries the Jews were eagerly anticipating the moment of his appearance. And Jesus is making such an impact in Jerusalem that the question is being asked, could Jesus be the one we've been waiting for? 
So it's obvious, isn't it? Jesus is not the kind of person that you can have no opinion about. You see, what he says and does, it stands out. It confronts us. Maybe if we first meet him, we're not quite sure what to make of him straight away. But it's obvious, I've got to make something of this man. That's why in this chapter, if you read through, there is question after question after question. And all of them are essentially the same, asking, who is this? Jesus, too, throws in a few questions, but they're really all about him again. He's asking, what do people make of me? And so these actions and words of Jesus, in the end, demand you must have a verdict. And in this chapter, we get a range. Verse 12 gives us a flavour. There was much muttering about him among the people. While some said he's a good man, others said, no, he is leading the people astray. So some positive, some negative. Some wonder, is Jesus the Christ? Others think, is he the great prophet we've been waiting for? Some think, as we've seen, he's a good man. Others learned, at the very least. But there are plenty going the other way. He's a threat. This man leads others astray. Even he is demon-possessed. Jesus' words and action demand a verdict about him. And with that, as a verdict is given, there must be a response. You cannot avoid it. And again, there'll be a range following from who people think Jesus is. For a start, people marvel. Well, that's inevitable at what he says and does. But then it must go further. Some believe in him, others don't. Some ask questions because they want to find out more and get to the bottom of this. Some recognise he is unique. We've never seen anyone like this. But some want him to be dealt with. They want him arrested. They want him killed. Verse 43 sums up the situation in Jerusalem. There was a division among the people over him. And all this, doesn't it, sounds remarkably contemporary. That is, today, whenever Jesus is spoken about, what he said and did, people respond in all sorts of ways. People marvel if they think maybe what he said and did happened, and they want to find out more. Today, others are hostile. There is this division. It happens in the church. When Jesus is presented... People object all the time. And more than that, people within the church will accuse others of being divisive. Surely they'll say, if everyone has these different responses to what you're saying about Jesus, you need to be quiet. It's harming our unity. They say, please don't speak of Jesus anymore. Which is astonishing, isn't it? Jesus is very concerned for unity. But unity in the truth about him. Any unity that depends on sidelining Jesus, well, is a unity not worth having. And it's not just in the church, the world out there, as it hears about Jesus, we should expect, again, this division. As people hear, some will be intrigued, impressed, attracted to him. Others will be disagreeing, unpersuaded, and want to hear no more about Jesus. But again, division is not necessarily a sign that the messengers are getting it wrong. In fact, it might be that the message is getting through. We should expect division. After all, it's exactly what Jesus faced in Jerusalem. But it does raise a question, doesn't it? Why? Why would there be division like this? Is it that actually, at the end of the day, Jesus simply isn't clear? He's giving off mixed messages. People can't really get to the bottom of who he is. Some will be quick to suggest, maybe we just can't know. We can't be sure what the truth is about Jesus. And in particular, we see throughout this chapter that opposition to Jesus is mounting. How can some think he's a good man? Maybe they don't know what the others know. This hostile response. How is it Jesus is on the most wanted list? in the first place. Well, that brings us to the second thing that the fugitive Jesus does in Jerusalem. He divides, but that's because Jesus exposes. He exposes. 
So John 7 begins with Jesus' brothers trying to tell him what to do. It's there in verse 3. His brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples also may see the works you are doing. For no one works in secret if he seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So the brothers are convinced that what Big Brother needs is more exposure. Jesus needs a higher profile. He needs better PR. So he's got to get to the capital. He's got to move in the right circles. And then his ministry will take off. Which just goes to show they haven't understood their Big Brother at all. They haven't grasped what he's about. And so Jesus sets them straight in verse 7. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify about it that its works are evil. What our view of this world in which we find ourselves? Jesus is very simple and sobering. Its works are evil. And he's not simply talking about the world in general out there not being quite as we'd want it. No one would disagree with that. No, Jesus is talking about every individual making up this world. He's saying we all have a problem. For each of us, according to Jesus, our works are evil. And surely we think that is a bit strong. Evil. Now, language like that for Boko Haram militants in Nigeria or for the sex offender in the news, okay. But for everyone, what are we to make? What are they going to make of what Jesus says? Even maybe as we find ourselves disagreeing with the verdict, we have to ask ourselves, who are we to pass judgment on what Jesus is saying? Because Jesus is speaking to the Jews. They know what the Bible says about our world and our place in it. God made it and each of us. And we were made to love this God as we should with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. Our creator is worthy of our complete devotion. And that is what is the very best for us. And yet even hearing those words... If we bristle against it, that that is how I should live, well, that shows Jesus is right. There is evil, anti-God attitude within me. And it's not just within. Jesus' point is this evil will show itself in how we live. Remember who Jesus is talking to. He gets to Jerusalem. This is where the religious upstanding types are. They're even there for the festival. They're the keen ones. Yet Jesus says all the same. Each time anyone chooses to live to please themselves, whatever that looks like, and not God, well, that is fundamentally against God and so evil. Now, obviously, Jesus' brothers, those in Jerusalem, don't want to hear this. And nor do we. It seems Jesus hasn't read the key book, How to Win Friends and Influence People. There is no flattery at all. He doesn't smooth over the cracks. Here this week, we've had all the bump through the door, haven't we, about the elections. Politicians basically trying to tell us what they think we want to hear. Well, Jesus has none of that. He simply says it as it is. And the point here in John 7 is that is what explains the responses to Jesus. You see, we often say, who do you think Jesus is? But the issue is not simply me neutrally at arm's length, sitting down and thinking through what he said, what he did, trying to piece together who he is. Because the issue is not what I think of Jesus and his actions, because as soon as I come close to him, I find out what he thinks about my actions. And coming face to face with what I am like, that is very uncomfortable. And I have to do something about it. So here in Jerusalem, Jesus is never going to win a popularity contest. As Jesus himself says, his hearers don't like what they hear, and they hate him for it. They hate Jesus. Jesus exposes this even further if you look down to verse 19. 
He asks the crowd, why do you seek to kill me? The crowd almost laugh it off, suggest how ridiculous. But Jesus knows that in the end, people will do whatever it takes to silence him. Actually, five times in this passage, we hear talk of killing Jesus. And that's the way it is still today. Around the world, there is this murderous hostility against Christ. Sure, Jesus is no longer here in the flesh. And so this hatred is expressed towards his people. Many of us will have heard about Miriam Ibrahim in Sudan at the moment, pregnant, but sentenced to death for refusing to renounce her Christian faith. Many, many more faithful Christians from Nigeria, Syria, because they stick with Christ, are losing their lives. We come closer to home. Thankfully, wonderfully, we are spared physical persecution like that. But all the same, London today wants Jesus, the Jesus of the Bible, the real Jesus, silenced. Even in churches. Pick a church at random. The odds are there may be Bibles in the building, the name of Jesus in the songs. But they don't actually want to open those Bibles and probably read properly what Jesus said and did. They refuse to listen to what Jesus says about themselves and how they should act. All this delights the atheist Richard Dawkins. He was speaking yesterday at the Hayes Festival. He described himself as a secular Christian. (laughs) Remarkably, he was asked, what does that mean? Well, he explained, he likes the tradition and the nostalgia of the church as long as it's without the words and actions of Christ. Not just in the church. Jesus must be silenced, mustn't he, in the office or at the school. There's no problem, is there, talking about last night's Champions League and how many goals were scored by Welshmen and Englishmen. There's no problem catching up on the latest instalment of that TV series. But speak of Jesus... Or out with friends in the coffee shop down the pub at the school gate. We talk, don't we, about our health issues. That's a topic of conversation. We don't dare speak of the one who can heal a paralytic. We share the latest gossip. Who said what to whom? We don't speak of what Jesus says. Let me ask each of us, how many times in the last week did we name Jesus publicly? For most of us, why did we do that so rarely? Well, it's the same as it was in Jerusalem. Look down to verse 13. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. And that fear is justified. If anyone was to turn to Jesus, if we are to speak of him, the world will hold it against us. Family, Friends, the religious even, won't like it. And so for anyone considering the claim of Christ, again, it's not a neutral decision. People know that if they turn to Christ, they're going to face the consequences from others. If we do become Christian, then we learn, don't we? We're impressed on, don't take it too seriously. Definitely keep quiet. Uh, Do read later how Perry became a Christian. He explains it more on that little green sheet. He tells us how becoming a Christian made life more difficult. And in a number of ways, that is exactly what we all should expect. Because here in John 7, Jesus exposes that the works of the world are evil. The world doesn't want to hear that, so it hates Jesus and his people. No wonder he is a marked man, because he speaks the truth. Wonderfully, we can't leave it there. That is not all that Jesus does in Jerusalem. Third, Jesus in Jerusalem offers life. Jesus offers life. Now, when we discover that someone is on the wanted list, first question in our mind, what have they done? Well, Jesus addresses that issue in verse 21, where he says... Jesus answered them, I did one deed, and you all marvel at it. 
So that one deed is healing the lame man. People are amazed, not surprisingly. It's not every day a lifelong paralytic hops up on his feet. But Jesus is now addressing the issue he knows that has caused such hostility against him. But why would they want to kill him because of this? Well, the background is that Jesus performed this miracle on the Sabbath, the weekly Jewish day of rest. And the authorities decided that this kind of healing was a form of work. And so Jesus was breaking the Sabbath laws. They took it so seriously, they had decided Jesus should die for this. And they thought the Old Testament law was on their side. To which Jesus responds, well, let's think about that for a moment. As he goes on in verse 22, he says, Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Now you see in the Old Testament, circumcision was required on the eighth day of the baby boy's life. And naturally, in the course of events, sometimes that eighth day would fall on the Sabbath. But all were agreed that in such circumstances, those performing the circumcision on the Sabbath would not be guilty of breaking the law about work. So, Jesus then pushes through with this logic. If you can do what is right for one part of the body on the Sabbath, how much more should you be perfectly satisfied if a man's whole body is made well on the Sabbath? As ever, Jesus' argument is irrefutable. And so he makes the appeal in verse 24. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. Don't be superficial, Jesus says. Draw the right conclusions from all they see him saying and doing. In all this fuss about the Sabbath, pay attention to what he actually did. He undid disability. He restored a man to fullness of life like no one else before or since. So that's halfway through our passage and halfway through the feast in Jerusalem. So we wonder, how will people respond to Jesus' appeal? And it's more of the same. Again, some positive comments, some questions. But with that, more attempts to arrest him and to get rid of him. What will happen now? Well, the feast in Jerusalem continues building to its climax. And then we read down in verse 37. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out. Think of the Olympics in London. That's what the feast in Jerusalem was like. Everyone coming to town, passions running high. And after a great time, imagine the closing ceremony. And there you have the president of the Olympic Committee standing up to say a few words, all eyes and ears fixed on him. Well, likewise, here on the great day of the feast in Jerusalem, Jesus, if you like, breaks any cover that he still had. He stands up. He takes center stage. He has something that he has to say. He demands to be heard. And you can imagine the crowd, people thinking, what is he going to say? Is he going to denounce all this persecution he's facing? Is he going to give more self-justification for his actions? Well, let's listen in. Jesus cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now, this he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. There's Jesus before the crowd in Jerusalem. He knows full well that out there are people just itching to kill him. And he makes the most astonishing offer to them all. Living water for any who are thirsty. Well, are we thirsty? 
It's hard for us to appreciate the force of what Jesus says here because water is too readily available. Most of us have never known really what it is to thirst. But did you see the film 127 Hours? A true story where the main character, Aaron Ralston, is mountain biking in a national park in Utah when he falls down a narrow canyon. His arm gets pinned between a boulder and the rock wall. And try as he might, he simply cannot work himself free. It's a hot time, the sun is beating down, his water is soon gone. And after five days, his desperation for water is such that he cuts off his own arm. Water is essential for life. Jesus says, are we thirsty? You see, there'll be some, when they hear the words of Jesus, where he explained that the works of the world are evil, they won't react against it. Instead, they'll say, yes, that is me. Jesus is right. If you like, they've realized that what he says is true. They've turned away from their maker. There's no excuse. They want nothing more now than to be right with him again. They are desperately thirsty for that. They long for forgiveness. They long to enjoy again the satisfying relationship with their maker, now and forever, for which they were made. But the thirst is agonizing because they know there is no way to satisfy it, even by cutting off an arm. Because if our works are evil, if we have treated God like that, well, what can be done? And then Jesus stands up at the feast and says, if anyone is thirsty, come to him. It's significant he makes this offer at the Feast of Booths. This commemorated God's provision for his people when they were wandering in the wilderness after he rescued them out of Egypt. You can read the story in Exodus, but during that journey, again, the people ran out of water. They were desperately thirsty. They cried out to God, and God responded. He told Moses to strike a rock with his staff. From that, water gushed out, and the people were satisfied and could go on their way. We read on in the Old Testament, the prophets used this image of water gushing out, God coming to meet his people's needs, to satisfy our deepest desires. And then Jesus says, verse 38, rivers of living water will flow. And he says they'll flow from his heart. Again, we think, well, what does he mean? And verse 39 is a pointer. This he said about the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for as yet the Spirit had not been given, because Jesus was not glorified. So God's Spirit was to come to live within God's people, those who believed in Jesus. But Jesus says it will only happen when he's glorified. So again, when is this, we ask? Well, did you notice here in John 7, Despite it being one man, Jesus, against all the authorities, they simply can't get their hands on Jesus. He's that bar of soap slipping out of their hands. Because, look at verse 30. They were seeking to arrest him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. We read on, we discover this hour is the hour of Jesus' death. That hour is the moment of his glory. And we keep reading on. And when Jesus was hanging on the cross, John 20, we're told this. When the soldiers came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear. And at once there came out blood and water. Blood flows from Jesus' side. Immediately we're reminded of what he said back in John 7. Yes, Jesus died, but not ultimately because these opponents got their way. No, this is the plan of God. This is how that evil of which we are all guilty can be dealt with once and for all. And with that then, our deepest thirst can be satisfied. It's because of Jesus' death, which he knows he will endure, 
that Jesus says and can make that offer in verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So again, let's just take a step back and think in the context of John chapter 7. Why is it that when the world hates Jesus, anyone, we, would choose to believe in him? Why would anyone, why would we be willing to speak up, even want to speak up, saying that we're with Jesus and explaining what he's done? Well, I guess for the very same reason that Jesus stood up and spoke and cried out at the Feast of Booths, there is a desperate need, an urgent thirst around us. The stakes are too high to remain silent. You see, Jesus knew full well the world's hostility towards him, but he came into the world because he wanted to meet the needs of a thirsty world. He knew, and there is a desperate, deep satisfaction within all of us. And as the world hears that its works are evil, some are brought to their senses. They realize they're cut off from God. That's the problem. And they see that's why Jesus died. That as we believe in him, we receive the true life that brings us this deep, lasting satisfaction. And as we are those who have begun to share in that living water, we want others to share in it too. And it is from there the courage comes to keep speaking of him. So here in John 7, we've seen a fugitive. We've seen Jesus at work. And he continues to work in the same way in our world today. As what he has said and done is spoken of, Jesus will divide. And we've seen that's not because of the strength of the evidence alone. It's because he exposes that the works of the world are evil. And so because of that, in the end, there are only two things that anyone can do with Jesus. Either we hate him and we find the very mention of him intolerable and we do whatever we can to get rid of him. Or we recognize this is the Christ. This is the king sent from God who knows what we are like but is still offering me the life-giving water of the Spirit. Let's pray as we close. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Our Father, we praise you for your Son, for sending him and who made so clear in word and action that he is the Christ, your King. We thank you that he tells us what we are really like, that we might come to him for what we so desperately need. And we praise you again for his death for the world, that as we and anyone believe in him, we receive this water of life to satisfy us now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.